Hey guys, in this video we're going to be reviewing a game from Bob. Bob is one of our Chess Goals members. And Bob, do you want to give us a little bit of a background about this game? Um, yeah, um, I've been playing in the, the uh, Lee Chess Lone Wolf um, uh, League uh, competition and I uh, found it very interesting. So this is one of the one of the games, previous ones we've looked at um, online congresses from the 4NCL. Um, but I've got a number of games from, from Lone Wolf that I've, I've played in. So um, I think the opposition has been sort of my level, um, uh, probably a, a bit higher, a bit more experienced. So I've been losing a lot, but I'm hopeful learning a lot. And that's the purpose of game analysis and going through this with you. So hopefully we'll learn something today. And Bob, you're playing the black pieces in this game. So we can see your rating here is 1804 and the opponent uh, Nevado is rated 1953. Yes, yeah. I am. Um, I'm always a little skeptical of the ratings online in Lee Chess, and especially with my experience in 4NCL. But um, yeah, it's, it's it was sort of we're not too far apart, but generally the more experienced I've found on Lee Chess than I am. And these are classical ratings too. So sometimes you find the opponents just don't have a lot of games in in online classical play. Um, so in this game, we see a Karo Khan. Yeah. Yeah, and this is your influence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a Carol Khan course, Chesco's Carol Khan course. So there's a lot of Carol Khan players. And this is our recommendation, 3C5, um, putting the immediate pressure on this pawn. And what do you think of this move, knight f3, already on move four? Um, no, that was... I, I was... Yeah, it's probably one that I, I don't know this opening so well. So, you know, I joke that I'm out of book after a few moves, but I am because I don't really spend that much time on openings. I get some of the ideas and I try and look at some of the key the key points. Um, but after that, I'm on my own. And um, if I lose something or uh, I make a mistake, then I hope to try and pick that up in um, analysis afterwards. Um, because I'm trying to follow what you say is play a bit more and I try and do my tactics and do a bit more on um, my fixes on my radar and thinking about my, my opponent's plans and openings other than you know getting a broad shape and ideas uh, is all I'm really at at the moment I, I haven't really got the lines down in my head and I don't spend a lot of time practicing that and I think that's good um, so yeah like Bob said one thing we talk about quite a bit in our discord server is we need to just play more games, right? We can't spend eight hours a week memorizing our openings and <laughs> one hour a week playing. Um, so one thing you can think about here strategically, if white doesn't take D takes C or play C3, we can really highlight the fact that this D4 pawn is not defended. Um, so after knight F3, it is defended, but it's defended by a knight. I would recommend taking here right away. Right, okay. Because after this, now we have this target on e5, and we have an extra center pawn. So we have two center pawns to white's one, and this kind of gives us something positionally to work on. We can fight against this pawn on e5. So that'd be just a small difference, but I think, you know, in terms of stockfish eval, knight c6 right. is a perfectly fine move, and this could transpose um, if okay. white plays c3. And, and the recommendation... Uh, you would have is take the pawn in 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 the course. So, is it? So. Yeah, I believe that's right. But sometimes I get my own recommendations wrong. <laughs> but I think that's right. So here we have knight c6, bishop e2, and then you do take. So this kind of will transpose to the line in the course. Right. And here your opponent castles, so they're not immediately going back after this pawn. Um, but you also can't uh, really easily defend this pawn. Putting the queen out early is not very appealing. Um, so here, I think, again, we have a small improvement for you. And this is something where you don't have to necessarily memorize these moves because your opponent's move order is probably not in the book. So this comes down to kind of thinking about the structure. Right. Um, one thing we try to do whenever possible is get this c8 bishop outside of the pawn chain. and. On our YouTube channel, my OTB game review number one from the tournament I just played, it was a Karo Khan exchange variation where I got my bishop trapped inside the pawn chain. And it's mm. kind of similar to this where the, the best move was actually bishop to g4. Mm. 
Mm. So getting the bishop outside of this pawn chain, let your opponent still play their knight b to d2, and then go e6. Yes, yeah. I, I, as soon as I played e6, I thought, what am I doing? Um, and it, I, don't, I can't even explain my thought process of why that I did that. Um, and I, I say in my notes afterwards that I, I realized that I should have just, just played the bishop, but for some reason I played the pawn. Yeah, and then the nice thing is, because it's a slow game and we've reviewed it, you've reviewed it, that's something that you'll remember next time, right? Get that bishop out. Oh, to... Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> or if it happens again, then it'll be more likely the third time. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have been known to make the same mistake more than once. Me too, okay. me too. <laughs> <laughs> so now you play bishop c5. Okay, trying to hold the pawn. Knight b3. So white is going to win that pawn back, but that's completely okay because... Even though Stockfish is saying this is about even, we know, uh, you know, from other lines in the course and from practice that we can still play against this pawn on e5. And I think that's what you're going to do in a couple moves here. Yeah, yeah. So we see knight g to e7, heading out to g6. Um, and this is a case where, you know, if you look at Stockfish too closely, sometimes it'll say inaccuracies here and there. I see it saying inaccuracy. Um, and I think the reason why is Stockfish is saying you could try to win the pawn on e5 here, but it's white is getting compensation for the pawn. So like if knight takes here, knight takes e5, you're left with a bad bishop. White has the bishop pair, and it really kind of changes the nature of the game. It's becoming mm -hmm. more dynamic. Um, so I think what you did is actually perfectly fine. Knight e7, you're just playing the solid and positionally keeping your strong bishop on b6. It, it, it's one of the ideas that I um, I just remembered from looking at things was just getting those knights and attacking that that pawn. I don't, I don't necessarily remember all the move orders, but um, it's just sort of the the, the principle of um, doing the development of uh, the dark squared bishop and then the knights is just a pattern. And so I, I would look to play that because of because that was just one of the themes and ideas. As I said, I don't really remember necessarily all the precise move orders. No, I think that you're exactly right. Um, this is kind of just following the thematic ideas that we see in these Karokan structures. And the interesting thing from this position, it's sort of difficult to find a good move for white, right? White's having trouble finding a plan. And on the very next move, we see white makes a decision that's not ideal, right? He wants to put the knight into d6 with check. But mm. as soon as you castle, this knight already looks misplaced. So we see an inaccuracy by white there. And in the next few moves, um, you know, sometimes we talk about players being comfortable or uncomfortable in a position. I think white's uncomfortable here because if we watch the next few moves, let's see what happens. Um, there's a few mistakes in a row by white coming up. So knight g6, double attacking this pawn, or key one to defend. a6, the knight retreats. And now bishop c7, and we see there's three attackers on this pawn. And I think already White's panicking a bit, right? How do we defend this e5 pawn? Um, I don't see a good way to do it. So what White ends up doing is giving up their bishop pair. Bishop g5 and yeah. taking on g6. So how do you feel about this resulting position? Um, yeah, I was, I was OK with this. Um, and I thought, you know, I'd, I'd come out the opening, I, you know, you know, on par, I thought. I, I still thought I had work to do. Obviously, um, you know, I've got double pawns, but, you know, I've got, got to make the, the use of the bishop pair. My my light squared bishop is, is rubbish, and uh, I've got some improvements to do. Um, yeah, uh, so, so I was okay, but I was, I was, I probably let white drive too much on on here, but um, I, I felt okay with my position. I didn't, I didn't think I messed anything up so far. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think the c8 bishop, the worst minor piece for you, can get in the game pretty quickly with a b5 bishop b7 because this d pawn is not blockaded. So you do have a chance to push it up later, and that bishop pair is going to come to life. And white has a lot of passive pieces, right? This bishop on g5, knight on f3 is kind of stuck defending. This bishop, there's a good chance he'll be stuck defending the pawn. Um, so there's not really a great plan forward for white. And if you look at the Stockfish eval, you're up about one pawn already. 
So a lot of kind of strategic advantages for you in the position, even though the material is equal. Right. Okay. So here we see queen d3, queen f7, rook d1. So white's doing a good job developing, and you're getting your uh, pieces in as well. Bishop to h4, knight to e7. Okay, so this is a point where you have a note here. Um, you said another potential hanging piece when the pawns come under pressure. Yeah, so what are your thoughts about this move, looking at it now, knight e7? Um... Yeah, I, I I suppose I hadn't, and this is this is a uh, my observation in this game is that I just didn't see what the the, the ultimate outcome could could be with these um, these sort of hanging pawns. I suppose when they come under pressure and you know not being able to take back, so I needed to probably think about that you know intuitively more than calculating everything, and I hadn't really. Um, visualize you know what what could be happening and probably just the geometry of um you know three minor pieces lining up like that without being secured and also sitting behind the pawns uh with two rooks behind them just just wasn't a good feel um but that didn't occur to me in the game so i think if i look at this position from your point of view i like that you have the, that kind of lasting pressure on e5 um, here you can kind of use the principle of two weaknesses, even though it's not necessarily like an individual weak point. I think the second uh, sort of weakness or thing to kind of distract white from this pawn is the queenside play. Mm. So you can go for like a quick b5, b4, push the a pawn, because if your bishop can come out this way eventually, that solves the problem of your last minor piece. Mm. And your rook can come to the c file. But what you have here is sort of this two versus three with a half open C file. Mm. So based on the pawn structure um, and this light bishop needing into the game, I think that would be my strategy. And if you want, you could insert like an H6 G5 over here just to kind of secure that bishop onto G3 on a passive square. Um, but long term, I like this plan. Yeah, that, that's probably what I was I was lacking. I was kind of responding and, and not realizing you know the, the breaks i needed to make and you know support presumably with that then you know the um the, the a um rook would come across to c c file in in support would it yeah that's or, right or behind the pawn or i think on the c file because you might get uh, a lot of pressure right on the c2 pawn in the end and right. since there's no light square bishop for white i could even picture a timely queen f5 hitting the queen hitting the c2 pawn this knight on c3 might be kicked already by our b pawn. So we could get some quick play going. Yeah, I, I think that's where I'm I'm lacking because you get to the opening and you, you get a few ideas, but then you haven't got into the middle game and the plans and, and, and knowing where your pieces go and what you should be trying to do. And um, you know, that's probably an area that I, I, should, I should look at a bit more. Um, what would you recommend to sort of try and try and get that in is that is that just seeing more whole games from sort of Karakan perspective i think so so I, th I think that goes back to kind of the value of playing a lot of games um because in this game you have a 30 plus 30 time control mm. in my opinion this is sort of like one of the the moments that you want to spend a lot of time so if you look at what's happened you've sort of got every piece developed and after bishop h4 now you're kind of moving the the first piece a second time. Mm. So here is where you're starting to say, okay, I got each piece on the best square. Now let me start to formulate a plan. This is where you can spend more time and think, you know, what do I want to do long term? Because let's say you have this plan in mind that we just discussed, like pushing mm. the B pawn, rook c8, maybe knight a5, queen f5. If you have that plan in mind, you could probably play a lot of those moves pretty quickly here. As long as your opponent doesn't seem to have any big threats coming up. Yeah. Um, so what you can do is just the more and more Karo cons you play, after every single game, go back and look at the plans. And you can look at them with Stockfish or um, another human. But it's even fine to, like, let's say you turn on Stockfish here. It's even fine to just try out other plans. Like, okay, well, what happens if I play an immediate B5? All right, Stockfish says 94, and there's a tactic. 
Okay, so let's try something else. We know 94 is an idea. So maybe we want to start with knight to a5, right? Like just try out different things and see, okay, knight g5 is a reply. But you can play around with it a bit and just get a good feel for this position. Um, and then the next time it comes up, you'll be that much more likely to kind of remember like, okay, here's some ideas for white and here's some ideas for, for black. Okay, so let's see what happens after knight e7, knight g5, very aggressive by white, queen to e8. And it's interesting because if we think of like takeaways from white's point of view, putting that knight on on b5 early on and back to c3 did not help white. And now white's making this other aggressive knight move where really this doesn't seem to be helping white either. That knight seems a little bit off sides on g5. So what one of white's takeaways might be be careful with your knight moves, <laughs> you know, don't play too aggressively with the knights. And now we see a blunder by white with the knight move. Um, and this is where, like you were talking kind of about the tactics radar, this is where you have to start thinking tactics. Uh, and do you remember during the game, was this a move you spent a lot of time on? Um, I, I spent a little bit of time trying to calculate um, what was happening with everything here, and I was a bit um i didn't really want to take because of the um losing the bishop and i thought well can i take the, the pawn um and i thought and i i don't think i really calculated very well and i i just thought oh well it looks it looks sort of all right i can't say anything immediately in my calculation horizon range that's so bad but i know i'm going to come with maybe a bit of pressure it's got to be taken, you know, that, that was my view at the time. What's interesting here is like all the tactics seem to work pretty well for white, <laughs> the different trades. Yeah. Um, and in hindsight's twenty twenty, especially with the engine, but the best move is knight f5. Um, right. So this is one where if you are able to analyze the different lines and let's say either they look better for white or maybe they're just unclear. Like you think, okay, this line is just too murky and I don't feel I can solve it all with the allotted time. Then you can think of this from, uh, I hesitate to say it, from a risk perspective. <laughs> because you could say, okay, well, in this position, I know I, I'm better, right? You feel that yeah. your position's better, the imbalances are better, and it, it's a solid position. So it's pretty low risk to make a move like knight f5 not blowing the position open to tactics. You do have to look at, let's say, knight takes, pawn takes, queen takes, black with bishop. But outside of that, I don't see any real immediate tactics to calculate. Hmm. Um, so it's low risk to do knight f5. Yeah, that, that's probably, um, you know, as you say, hindsight 2020. I think that's a good way of thinking, though. Quite often, we let ourselves down in, in terms of doing, as I said before, the, the evaluation and thinking. You know, maybe about a position, but actually just going through the logic of that, um, what the move I played was was quite committing. And if I didn't know whether it was right or wrong, I, I shouldn't do it on the basis of, oh, I think I'm okay because I, you know, um, I'm placing in safer. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe I was just feeling a bit gung ho and thought my opponent made a mistake. So I, I thought I'd try and go for it. But, you know, that's, that's another lesson of this game. Well, uh, yeah. And if you do feel that you calculated it out clearly, I think it is better to trust your calculation, right? If you calculate that it all works out fine, I think you should go for it. Um, but then another thing I should add about kind of the risk reward is if, you, let's say in this position you're playing black, but you feel your position's worse. Let's say something is a little bit different in the position um, than this current one. Then you do kind of want to go for a, a messy line, right? Because you know you're worse in a solid position that's real quiet. You want to kind of add some variance to the position, give your opponent more chances to mess up with tactics. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens. Bishop takes e5, bishop takes e7. Yeah, so this is getting very complicated. Um, the best move for white is knight to c5. Hitting the bishop, hitting this bishop, still hitting the knight. And this is just getting weird, isn't it? Yeah, it was everything in the game hinged all on this, really. And, um, you know, once the dust had settled, I was in a lost position. And um, as I say, I hadn't really seen that. Um, that, but my, you know, my pawns 
were, were obliterated and the advantage had gone in, in this tactical exchange. Yeah, so after this, um, white already has a pretty large advantage because the last pawn is most likely dropping. Mm. And I don't think we have to go through the moves from here, Bob, because your opponent played so well. <laughs> but he kind of just, he kept pushing the queenside pawn advantage and has uh, well-placed pieces. Yeah, I, I disintegrated, uh, I think is fair to say, after that. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much you can do here. I, I looked for ways to create counterplay. I, I didn't see anything. <laughs> um, okay, so what are your overall takeaways from the game? I... I, sorry, if you, I, I think I did make a note of them in the. Um, oh yeah, in, I, I do see them. them in the notes. Oh, sorry, I haven't. I haven't got everything. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll read them. Head, so it looks like you said uh, you had four takeaways. Two of them are connected. Uh, number one, you felt that the key point was the tactical variations in the center over your hanging pawns, and you didn't handle this well. And you say here, well, let me just click on the last move so I can see all the text. Um, while you're doing tactics, find some positions to practice calculating positions and assessing them. Yeah, so I agree with that. And I think, um, you know, like the Yusupov books, they have some good positions like that where you really have to calculate. But also doing like high-rated high tactics on chess.com, that's something I want to start doing more of, really forces you to calculate everything accurately. Like you know there's a solution, and if you shoot for a very high correct percentage, like even give yourself 15 minutes on a tactics puzzle on chess.com, but maybe set the rating higher than your puzzle rating mm. and see, like, can I force myself to solve it? Um, then you say number three. Oh, sorry. Number two, connected with the uh, above. My evaluation of positions is still quite faulty. Yeah, so this is one where, you know, playing a lot of games like you're doing and, and reviewing them, Reviewing with the imbalance scorecard or kind of thinking about those imbalances, that can help quite a bit. And number three, clock management. Need to find yeah, some... I took, yeah. yeah, I was still under a bit of pressure time-wise on this, I think. So, um, you know, as you said, just manage that a bit better in the, in the opening. And some of that comes with confidence in the opening too, right? Which again goes back to playing more games. Because if your opening is confident, you can kind of really blitz out those moves and get to a position you're comfortable with. And then if you build on that with the early middle game planning out of the caro, that becomes a little quicker. Um, and that's another thing that I realized in my own games when I played OTB is I just wasn't feeling confident. And that caused me to play slowly. I wasn't sure of my moves and I wasn't calculating quickly as I am used to. Um, so I think playing the, playing extra games is going to help a lot with that. And then you mentioned number four, losing the initiative with the exchange. And I think you can kind of think about the, the risk reward in those scenarios and when do you mix up the position. But if you do calculate it out and think this is a winning line for me, then you should definitely go for it. Like don't let the risk reward mm. override yourself if you feel confident in your lines. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, wrap up this video. This is a uh, first game that Bob and I are analyzing, and I think there's going to be two more parts in this video, so stay tuned for the next two. Um, please give the video a thumbs up, and if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.